Good afternoon, everyone, for the final session. I am pleased to uh, welcome Christian Weinberger, from, who's Senior Advisor, Entrepreneurship and EU Policy from the European Commission. Uh, Christian is obviously a very uh, busy man, um, and we are grateful for him turning up this afternoon. Christian is going to give us his thoughts on uh, some useful, I hope, pointers on future innovation funds moving forward within the community. Christian, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I took the topic a bit uh, liberal, even though I didn't want to encode things. Uh, <laughs> 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 but this is just for security reasons. <laughs> um, just to understand the audience, how many of you are entrepreneurs, businessmen, earning money by sending invoices? Okay, fine. Ah, reasonable for Brussels. <laughs> Normally, Brussels is even less. Yeah, um, I am going to tell you a bit about what the Commission is doing in the context of entrepreneurship and innovation. I take it a bit broader because, you know, innovation, many people think innovation is having good ideas. And this is a big mistake. Those that rose their hand know this. <laughs> idea is one thing, but to make money out of an idea is much, much more difficult than to have the idea. So you have to have this entrepreneurial bug as well. But... First, I'll talk about innovation, what is in it in the next couple of years, and then I spend a few words also on entrepreneurship in a broader sense. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with this overall picture in Brussels, all these abbreviations, SIP and COSME and FP7 and Horizon 2020. Uh, anybody who doesn't know very well what these are? Okay. Okay. So I don't have to explain too much. Sorry. <laughs> um, so this was the old world, 2007 to 2013, um, and we have moved from the SIP to COSME, except that we lost a few things on the way, so some of the innovation projects went elsewhere. Uh, they went actually to Horizon. Um, and in fact, uh, so the, the relative reduction of funds in, from SIP to COSME is explained by this uh, splitting off, um, which still doesn't mean that it grew at all, and it still means that it's much smaller than Horizon. But anyway, that's life. That's what um, the legislators have given us. And there's still, in fact, a big opportunity for SMEs in there. Um, you can see in um, Horizon, in FP7 rather, uh, there was uh, funds of a total of um, 4.8 billion for SMEs. This is cut off a bit here. Um, and this has increased. Can I use this as a pointer? Ah, uh, no, no, I better not do this. Start again. Red button, okay, that's good. So, fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, here it is, okay. So, which goes up to 8.6 billion. So, that's still quite a, a big growth in SME funds, um, which includes now also something called the SME instrument. How many of you know SME instrument, what it means? few, okay, I'll come back later, but that will be useful then to explain a bit more. Um, so the point being, despite the fact that the COSME funds remained flat, the innovation for SME funds grew a lot. Not only this SME instrument, but also the normal conventional horizon participation of SMEs should be up. Now, this is partially also visual thinking, just by sewing, saying it should be 20%, it's not necessarily going to be 20%, because it also requires that there is a um, facilitation enabling of SMEs to take part, and we know all from FP6 to FP7, it was quite a big thing um, to make the program more attractive for SMEs to participate, and there were a number of measures taken that were actually reasonably successful, but, for example, the increased um, funding rate for SMEs has been cancelled again. So w let's see whether a 20% is maybe just a target and not necessarily reachable. Whereas I think, once I've explained it, you will agree that this SME... Oh, 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 press the wrong button again. Um, this is the red button. <laughs> so this, um, this SME instrument will be... I mean, we have seen this already. That's heavily oversubscribed. We have had the first round already, and it has been sort of 10 times or whatever oversubscribed. So this really will, will absorb all the money anyway that, that can be there. But I'll go also in a bit into detail on these various programs. What's new altogether? 
Well, in general, activities closer to market are being supported. And it's, it's a big problem. You, you put a lot of money, public money, taxpayers' money into research projects that sound very nice, that uh, scientists are very excited about. But in the end, they don't produce any return in terms of um, growth, employment, and all these nice things that politicians want to talk about. So getting closer to market should mean also getting closer to commercialization and to actually get to, to, to commercialization. Um, also, there is more focus now on uh, societal challenges, so what is really the objective of, of, of research. Um, and uh, yes, indeed, SMEs are an important element of um, the whole program. So more reasons, 30% more resources. Um, the participation for big projects is still there, but this is more science-oriented. But also the closer to market projects are particularly targeted Towards SMEs, there's on one hand the SME instrument, but also Eurostars has moved up in, in funding. Um, the problem being that you find normally when you have something very successful, you always find investors. This is the market. When you are still researching, or red button, this side, you also find lots of research money. But in between going from research to market, there is little funding available and little support available. And this is particularly where the SME instrument is, is getting in. You see their funding range, one to three uh, million euros. This is the phase two average project. No, not average, three million is the maximum, but still the targeted um, project value of applications for phase two in the SME instrument. Uh. Now, what is the SME instrument? In fact, it's, it's targeted towards individual companies that have technical solutions uh, on the verge of going out in the market. And you have their phase one, this is the normal concept, where you have an idea and you have to test does it at all, is it feasible? To, can, it, can it be theoretically be put on the market? What is the um, sort of the first test of can it stand the market needs? Is there customers there? Um, is the, does the uh, costs uh, at all equate with uh, somehow with uh, what can be um, uh, um, obtained as a price from the customers? So sort of commercial feasibility testing. And there, the SME instrument, phase one, supports 50,000 euros lump sum given to the companies that are successful. First call, I mentioned it, 2,800 applicants, um, 155 have been uh, granted their 50,000 euros uh, because that was the amount foreseen for the first round. Phase two, uh, gets closer to market. So there you, you talk about prototyping, about testing, about evaluating manufacturing, manufacturing capabilities, uh, scaling up. Um, very important phase because phase one still is to a certain extent theoretically you haven't invested a lot except for brains and uh, um, a number of researchers. Phase two becomes already more expensive because there you really have to test the things, you have to produce, set up um, not fully scaled assembly lines, but still have to test how you will actually put this on the market. Um, much more intensive, and there, I don't know why it says up to 2.5, because in reality it's up to 3 million uh, euros contribution towards uh, the cost that the uh, company has. Phase three, uh, this is uh, commercial, or very close to commercial, commercialization. Uh, there is no funding from the SME instrument anymore. Um, but there should be possibilities to get um, uh, financial means, uh, financial guarantees, uh, maybe links with um, business angels, venture capitalists, which should have even started before and in the overall process. But the, the funding that comes out of Horizon 2020 applies to uh, phase one and phase two. So from the idea to the market um, continuous support. The SM instrument is for the time linked to the societal challenges. So it's not possible to make applications outside the topics that have been defined by Horizon 2020. We wanted to get it broader. We, when I say we, I mean DG Enterprise. 
Um, and um, I think also the European Parliament wanted to get it broader, member states and the um, DG research insisted that it should be narrow. We'll see what happens at the um, 2016 um, review, but at the same time, if we haven't enough budget anyway, we might just leave it the way it is. So we have this op this, this different uh, paths. First of all, collaborative research, just like it was before, very much research excellence oriented. On the other side, you have the SMEs and, and, and sort of consortia and big partners and research institutes and so on. On the other hand, we have the SME instrument, which is very much commercialization excellence oriented. Individual companies, no consortia, very much SMEs driven or I mean, SMEs are the ones who take the initiative and then they can still take on board some others to help them doing that. And in between, Eurostars, again, has existed before and in fact, the, the budget is also significantly increased now. In line with the different objectives of the various programs, you also have to sort of use different methods to write the proposal. On, in, in, the, in the collaborative research, the main thing is still, as I said, the um, uh, technological scientific excellence. Um, and then you should also explain that uh, maybe there's some commercialization value in it. Uh, whereas for the SM instrument, you have to clearly describe what is the markets, what is the uh, competitors, what is the uh, um, possibility uh, that you're looking after, what is the, the business plan and so on. Uh, so you cannot submit one proposal that, did, that failed in one project uh, in the other. That won't work. Um, again, talking about SMEs, there in fact, uh, there's lots of possibilities for SMEs to take part. Uh, certainly still also the Marie Curie um, program allows SME participation and in fact gives incentives. Uh, we, we still see that uh, while this is of course uh, a funding of individual researchers, still the link between researchers and SMEs should be increased and this is one of the objectives of uh, uh, Marie Curie and that is there, it, but it's not used enough, unfortunately, in, in reality. And then you have all the other things I talked about, also access to finance, risk finance, which is now shared between COSME and, um, and Horizon 2020. And there's also a particular program, Innovation in SMEs, to which I'll come also in a moment. So, main things to remember, SME instrument is linked to societal uh, challenges in the late areas. Um, they're selected based on commercial excellence, on economic impact, on, on profitability of the idea on the market. Single company support, but there has to be some European link, so if you just apply for one country, your market is one country, uh, your product is a some sort of narrow market segment, then it's not likely you get funding from the SME instrument budget. Who supports you if you have ideas? Of course, there's this NCP uh, network that was there before, NCP contact points specifically for, for SMEs, but they are more focused to, towards the collaborative projects, uh, so they're not really specialists in SME instrument. On the other hand, the Enterprise Europe network, uh, how many of you know the Enterprise Europe network? Not so many as I would have thought, okay. This is the sort of, it is indeed more supporting SMEs in a single market, helping them to overcome obstacles to trade the goods, products between member states and so on. But they also have um, one of their pillars in advising SMEs how to participate in European projects. So they should be available for all sorts of um, funding channels from the EU, including um, Horizon or FP7 in the past. Um, and they actually will specialize or are being specialized at the moment in the SM instrument. So they give particular support to the SM instrument. And in fact, there are some 600, um, so it's not one per member state, but there's some 600 outlets throughout the EU and in fact also in all the, the SIP um, participating, or COSME participating countries that will support 
businesses in, in applying. Uh, but in any case, they should both direct each other to, or the, rather the customer, the SME, to the other um, side if they're better placed to answer particular questions. Now, um, a few words about innovation in SMEs. Um, there you can see that, in fact, their, their Eurostars has been there, clusters have been there, and, but the idea is to show you that there's also services beyond direct money giving to companies, uh, but rather to go through indirect projects. And apart from these help desks that I mentioned, and also the uh, um, support given through various organizations and networks in the EU, uh, there is also an element there that tries to help to improve the design of projects. Uh, so in other words, giving advice, um, giving, um, ma making services available, um, and also to um, train and um, improve knowledge in, in terms of innovation within SMEs. And you've, uh, one example would be, for example, for the better service would be vouchers, innovation vouchers. These schemes are going to be continue to be funded and they come uh, from the innovation in SMEs uh, line. Um, there is various veins in this. Um, I wouldn't say it's revolutionary, it's rather evolutionary. Uh, as compared to the past. Um, there is Eurostars, as I mentioned, will be continued as well. Um, there is innovation support services available. This is going to be reinforced and professionalized, I would even say. Let's say in the past this was sort of a exploring phase or piloting phase. Now it will is going to be professionalized. Um, and um, also this innovation policy learning is something that will be further enhanced because in the end uh, there is a number of companies that are good enough, they just need a bit of a push, but there's many that are need to be elevated to the threshold and this is also something that should be funded um, from this um, budget. Now, different subject. Question asked to people, this is Eurobarometer survey. If you um, inherit 100,000 euros, what would you do with it? And the, the red bar is start a business. Uh, the orange bar is buy a house. The yellow bar is save the money. The green bar is spend things on you always wanted to buy. Um, and the green at the end is, is work less, stop working. And despite the fact that many people say what keeps them from starting a business is the lack of money available, when you ask them this question, say, you, here's 100,000 euros, what do you do with it? You have, on average, 14% of the people that would use that money to start a business. Isn't that surprising? And the other surprising thing is you have huge differences between various member states. In Romania, oh, oops, wrong button. Here it is. In Romania, 42% would start a business. Amazing, isn't it? In Denmark, or Austria, or Finland, 7%, 6%, 5%. Now, this, there's a special thing on here. The ah, gosh. Here at the bottom, there's the US. They also have only 14%. But that was at the very difficult times of the crisis, where lots of people were afraid of their existence, because they don't have these nice social security schemes that we have in Europe. So they were all worried they should put their money into saving. <laughs> just if something more happens. But still, d different story. What you see is there is a lot of, of difference in this. And there's also a lot of, of work, therefore, to, uh-huh. This, <laughs> this is encoded for your security. <laughs> <laughs> now it becomes lighter. Now, uh, this, this is... Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, this is, this is a challenge also for policymakers uh, to shape programs in order to make people more entrepreneurial or emphasize certain elements of entrepreneurship. And this chart was going to say that you can do this from structural funds. <coughs> so there's ideas that come from the, uh, from the um, 
sort of SME entrepreneurship uh, cosmic part, and there's money that comes from structural funds from the um, uh, from ESIF. And to support this, uh huh, what's going on? Uh, we have produced a number of guidebooks, um, also for example supporting um, service innovation. But other topics. There's also this one is on 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 entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial education using European money to sort of set the preconditions for innovation to happen. Uh, they all have a part that explains in general what, what the topic is about, but they also have an extensive part on good practices. What have others done to achieve this? How can you actually start initiatives yourselves um, using structural funds uh, to promote these uh, horizontal or more horizontal policy initiatives? Now, this last one is uh, the most interesting one. This is about um, get book about business angels. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's the problem. Maybe it's a font problem or something. <laughs> uh huh. Coming back to statistics, I'll tell you what, the, what it means. This is the question about how desirable is it for you, again asked to the European citizens via Eurobarometer survey, uh, how desirable is it for you to start a business. And you can see that in Iceland and Sweden and Norway, it's very um, desirable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, I think this is the feasible chart. How feasible is it to start a business? This is then more about desirable, how desirable. But the main thing is this delta tells you a lot again about different attitudes. Um, so you see here, in, and incidentally, this is just Scandinavia. It just turns out to be Scandinavia without any particular uh, interest behind this. This says, yes, it would be feasible for me to start a business, but I don't really want to. And at the bottom, you have all those that, that more or less want to start a business. And again, not too surprising, Greece and Portugal, they would like to start a business, but it's just not feasible. They cannot do it. So again, something for policymakers to take a very differentiated approach and say, okay, we'll need to address things country by country or even within countries, region by region. There is regions, I think in Scotland, anything is quite easy anyway, but throughout, <laughs> throughout England, uh, there is quite strong differences between the various regions in terms of entrepreneurial attitude. So that even if you did this within England, you'd probably find nine quite different um, um, results. As a result of this, the Commission has um, put forward this entrepreneurship action plan to say, okay, what needs to be done, what should be done, what could be done, uh, what does the Commission want to do, what should the Member States do, in order to develop these entrepreneurial attitudes more, in order to have more companies start a more entrepreneurial and therefore more innovative approach to things. And it has three pillars. The first one is starting early, um, entrepreneurial education and training, this attitude start at the very, very beginning. Some people, um, when I say you have to start in primary school, they say, but come on, what do you want to tell kids in primary school about stock markets? And I say, first of all, stock markets is not about entrepreneurship. Stock markets are about gambling. So it doesn't count for entrepreneurship. And secondly, the problem in primary school is that the teachers say, sit still, shut up, repeat what I said, don't start your brain thinking itself. <laughs> and it kills entrepreneurship. And this is what has to stop. There's no need to develop particular any features, but to have this attitude to say, okay, fine, if you're an innovative kid, if you're, if you're a creative kid, if you have ideas, good, fine. Maybe you can respect a bit that there's others who want to listen to what the teacher's saying, but don't kill it. And later on, it starts also in, during secondary school to, to, to develop certain things, social skills, which are very important for entrepreneurship, other things. So it's a whole policy area in itself to how to properly develop an entrepreneurship education strategy. And some member states have this, and others are, are developing it. Some others are still considering whether they should or not. But important element of this. Second thing is the environment. And there, of course, we talk about... Um, financing and, um, and support and uh, how to get um, innovation vouchers and all these kinds of things. And the third element is, is one about culture, cultural change. Um, how can you make people, even in the public at large, be more 
responsive to entrepreneurial thoughts. Um, why do 88% of Europeans think that, and this is again differentiated by country, that entrepreneurs are those greedy guys who squeeze the blood out of their entrepreneurs to become rich and buy the third yacht? <sighs> Something wrong there. It needs to be a bit developed. That, uh, in fact, those are the guys that create um, jobs in Europe. 85% of jobs in Europe that have been created in the last 10 years or 9 years have been created by small businesses. So um, change the mindset, and this you can do through, through uh, role models and um, other initiatives to influence the public. Oh, mamma mia, again. This is to explain, and I have to read it out to you. <laughs> this is to explain what, what do we mean by entrepreneurship. So this is oh, <laughs> T-O, to enterprise. <laughs> And this explains, it's, um, what does it explain? Ah, oh, mamma mia. <laughs> I'm so used to reading this off now, I have to think. <laughs> um, it's um, um, an attitude that in order uh, to uh, accept risk, to develop ideas, to be creative, to, oh, I'm already speaking about the world, so be creative. <laughs> Uh, develop develop a, a way how to implement the plan which actually helps you this attitude that should be developed through teaching which actually helps you um, first of all to be more able to manage yourself and this is how we get the teachers on board we have the European teacher trade union support this idea of entrepreneurship education in school because they say it helps the pupil to manage themselves to make something out of their life. So it's not related to making money. It's first of all, manage yourself. Secondly, um, to be um, a more employable. Even an employee who knows that there's objectives, there's things to be done to achieve this, to manage how to achieve this objective, who, who asks himself, shouldn't we do this or that, is more valuable than one that sits there and waits for instructions. But then of course, third element also is to, um, um, start a business, uh, be it commercial or maybe also non-commercial, also NGOs that would not be successful, they wouldn't have this attitude to plan and think of measures and cooperate and so on. So in, a, in all kinds of ways, this entrepreneurship education is something very um, practical and very useful. And in fact, ah, now you can read. <laughs> in, in, fact, <laughs> in fact, this is not something that was invented by... by um, the Enterprise DG, but by the Education DG. So the Ministers of Education in Europe have thought that this is something that should be one of the key competences of lifelong learning. One of the eight key competences. And they didn't mention history, so you need to know more about entrepreneurship and about history. And again, there's a guidebook there, Building Entrepreneurial Mindsets and Skills in the EU, telling you how to use structural funds, how to achieve this objective. Another European initiative to make people more entrepreneurial is a program called Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs. How many of you know this program? I'm not talking about Erasmus for students, but Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs. Well, that's a lot. I wouldn't have thought that's so many. Okay. Um, it's there to help new entrepreneurs, both those that start or have started recently, but also those would-be entrepreneurs that are seriously considering to start, to test their ideas to get recommendations from other experienced entrepreneurs in another country. Oh, mamma mia. <laughs> uh, this is the host entrepreneur's um, benefits. <laughs> so what do they get out of this? And in fact, you would, you would expect, it's easy to explain what the young entrepreneurs get out of this. I mean, they get free advice on their new service, new product. Uh, they get... Uh, networking going, they get um, opportunity to, to learn on the job and so on. But you would think the host entrepreneurs, they would just sort of say, what's in it for me, why do I do this? And you find lots that find it attractive and you find even lots that say, okay, fine, when do, are you going to send me the next young entrepreneur? So they're so keen on doing it, they get so much out of it that they want more of, of this. And what it is, uh, you can read it here, <laughs> um, is, is first of all, help to innovate. Entrepreneurs have a blind spot, even though they're experienced, and they have a young person that thinks entrepreneurial, 
that sort of tells them, well, have you thought about this? Why don't you do this? And in fact, when we ask them what they have done, these, these young entrepreneurs, during the, um, this day, uh, they, the, the, the first number one thing is, is market research. So trying to find out okay, what could be new markets. The second element is how to explore other markets, how to internationalize, because they have to come from another member state. So somebody who wants to export from England to Sweden takes a Swedish new entrepreneur on board and finds out what the Swedish market is like and where are the niches and how do you get the Swedish consumers to buy your product or whoever buys the product. Um, and and uh, so there is a lot of in it also for the for the host entrepreneurs. Oof, and <laughs> it's it's difficult if I have to read this all out to you. This is built so that you can read while I speak. Now I have to explain everything that's on the chart. On this one, I don't have to. We need intermediate organizations. There's thousands of young entrepreneurs that are interested. Intermediate organizations help to filter those that have a genuine interest. Those that just want to go surfing to Spain. Uh, which are then rejected, of course. Um, and they are also building the links. So between host and new entrepreneurs, we have um, um, the entrepreneurs themselves who can look for their partner, but also the um, intermediate organizations who make, make these links. And, and lots of them are actually uh, also in the same vein as, as um, could be incubators, in fact, <laughs> dealing with uh, uh, sort of looking after care after their uh, young entrepreneurs that take part of, of their efforts. Now, these, these are the figures about the exchanges, and you have, um, interesting enough, uh, a strong bias for um, the United Kingdom, which is very much, as, as also, in fact, for the normal Erasmus for Students program, which is because of the language. Um, you have to more or less speak the language that is spoken there where you, where you go to. So when you go to Italy or Spain, it's very difficult because they don't speak English very well. Um, nevertheless, there is a strong component, oops, the strong component of Italians and Spaniards uh, who are interested to explore their ideas more. And, and it's, it's not so much, you, you might think, okay, they don't find a job anyway, so they try to go somewhere and do something reasonable with their time which would be not so bad in the first place either, but we, we don't allow this because the point is we want good host entrepreneurs and they have to get somebody on board who's really interested in entrepreneurship. And therefore those that just want to usefully spend their time are normally not admitted in this case. Uh, but so there's a lot going there as well and then of course you have all the, the normal suspects. Okay, more information if you need more information and uh, I'm quite happy to answer any questions you might have. <coughs> Christian, thank you very much. <laughs> Christian, as you hear, has offered to answer questions. There's a lot of information there, some of which some of you knew, some of which is news to, uh, news to others of you. Do we have some questions for Christian while we have some of his time? Vladimir. Hello, I want to ask about the SME instrument. I did application to the first phase for the disruptive innovation, but I uh, wasn't successful because I just lost 0.9% uh, point before uh, under threshold. But the explanation what we did was really very short, like your proposal addressed criterion very well, but yet something can be approved. And in all criteria, I just have a very similar response. And I discussed this with our national contact point, and they tell us that uh, in all SME instruments, uh, they have uh, like this kind of short answers. And from our previous experience, when we applied to FP7 or something, it was much more better described what can be done better, because they said that it's easy to reapply if we improve the projects and go to the next step. But this is something that we are missing. Do you think it can be improved? Does this work as well? Yes, it does. Um, yeah, in fact, um, it is certainly not very um, encouraging if you get such a response because you put a lot of work in and, and you would have liked to get a better explanation of what is really missing. And I think there should be better explanation. The problem is this was, as you know, the cutoff date was beginning of June. The uh, results were announced in August. And with 2,800 uh, proposals to assess, this was quite a monstrous job. 
So I think the key explanation is that there was so many um, proposals to evaluate that there wasn't extremely much time for the evaluators to go back to the responses individually. But I'll pass this on and I'll ask um, them. And the second round is going on at the moment, so that certainly I don't think there will be a lot of possibility to change it. Because you, you need, in a setup, you need to allow more time for the evaluators to look at these. But I'll pass it on that this is frustrating and that it would be useful to improve okay, this. One question at the back there first and then. It's not a question. I want to follow up on your uh, response about the SME instrument. Uh, I happen to be an evaluator in this program. Oh. And so <laughs> I want to inform you that the evaluators are uh, writing uh, very, very clearly uh, their comments on each one of the um, little questions. There are many, nine, about 20, I think, 20 uh, questions to, to rank. Uh, it is probably uh, because there are very few people in the, uh, in the program management uh, uh, and so they are not capable uh, or they don't have the time to, to work on our uh, <laughs> evaluation and provide to you something m more clear. It is not fair, of course, because you probably don't have the chance to reapply. <laughs> Uh, because you don't have the comments. But uh, maybe if you ask specifically, they will give you something better. Okay. Okay. And the question down the front here. Yeah, may maybe just one little explanation also. The unit that the coordination unit that you're referring to that does this has been set up this year and it had, in the beginning of April, it still had two people working out of 44. So all those are very new people, and they still have to find their place, which is still, uh, it, it's an explanation, but not really a good reason. They should have done this before, but uh, you know how things work when something is new. I mean, on the other hand, I think it's, it's excellent to have this as an instrument. So rather than saying, okay, well, not enough people, not enough money, not enough time, I think it was entrepreneurial to say, okay, let's go ahead and let's, uh, let's after all, still do it and have the first date already that quickly. Yuri. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's a question. Uh, yesterday, the European Commission published first ever research about social enterprises in 28 member states. It's for the first time with common definition, with uh, some country reports. It was quite interesting. Uh, it was published yesterday, as I said. But this was published by another DG. So I'm just questioning myself and questioning you, are you communicating between different DG? Because you know, social economy, social entrepreneurship is a topic for another DG. And I know that sometimes, uh, I, I, I'm just wondering how much communicated on these issues because, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, in fact, social entrepreneurship is dealt with in a number of DGs, DG Marked, DG Employment, um, and I'm not sure which report you're talking about, but there's also one person in our directorate that deals with, um, with social entrepreneurship and, and CSR, and there's another person that deals with social economy. So the collaboration is reasonably good, um, but I, I think that there, there may be... Um, there isn't enough focus in the overall work program of the Commission on these topics. Mm. And that's why maybe you, you perceive that there is, there is different messages come from different ends. Mm. But, but people do talk to each other. It's right. not that they don't talk at all. Matt. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned in your presentation about um, innovation support services and the potential uh, the Commission is thinking about expanding um, innovation support services. I just wondered if you might be able to elaborate on that point. Um, I was referring to a particular initiative in the um, Innovation for SMEs uh, program, and in fact, I, there are an, a number of projects in the work program for 2014 and 15. If, we give, if you give me your business card, I'll ask the colleagues to send you um, those, or I can also send it, give, give them to you, and you can pass them on to everybody if there is general interest in this. Yeah. 
and there you can see what are the more precise ideas that are being pursued. Astrid. Yeah, a small question about the uh, Cosmo program. Uh, maybe it's due to the um, encryption or <laughs> that uh, I couldn't see it, but uh, wha what is particularly now the focus of the Cosme program? Well, the Cosme program, 60% of the Cosme program go into um, financial instruments. 25% um, go into market um, internationalization in general, uh, access to market uh, support which include also the Enterprise Europe Network. And most of the rest is for policy development. So there is hardly any money that is being handed out to SMEs in, in the context of calls for proposals. There's, uh, there are some calls for proposals, but they are more also targeted to find initiatives or to finance piloting initiatives that should help um, SME policy as a horizontal issue. But these programs that, w that were there for like um, um, environmental issues or, or, or green SME, greening of SMEs and so on, they are not part of COSME anymore. Okay. Any final questions? In question for uh, Christian? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> Next door, absolutely. Please. Uh, yeah, no, for the phase one uh, of the SMA instrument, is it uh, also uh, applicable the rule for uh, technology readiness level mi as minimum six <laughs> because to some extent is strange at the the time of uh, feasibility yes. study to yes. ask <laughs> yeah to ask for uh, yeah I, I know that it's yes but uh, the problem is that at the feasibility study stage uh, you ask uh, to to have uh, technology tested in relevant environment. So to some extent, feasibility studies is not so, I would say, too, too, too many things are, are have already done if you have tested in a relevant environment. So you're saying, I'm not sure I understand you correctly, but are you saying that there is, that the requirement is too high? Yeah, it's too high for feasibility study. Yeah, if you want to, to put this uh, uh, in the market for the phase two, I, I realize that it's normal to, to ask for uh, level six. But uh, for feasibility study, why so, so high? Okay, I cannot answer you this. Anybody in the room has any <laughs> comments to this? <laughs> I think it was only advantage. No, because it's written uh, that you, ha you have to, to describe uh, uh, the procedures uh, uh, that you have done, for example, to uh, the testing procedures uh, uh, for, for, for this, this, because this is uh, like a, pro a, a bit b before prototype uh, in, uh, in uh, operating environment. So they, they want you to describe uh, not just the concept, but uh, how it, it works uh, and uh, what kind of testing procedures you have uh, done. So, yes, a bit uh, problematic. I think we have the offer of some additional information from Panagiotis at the back. And it's written uh, at the website that uh, the minimum level is uh, Uh, you are uh, absolutely right. Uh, you have to start from technology readiness level number uh, six uh, in order to apply. And even uh, if it is not stated very clearly to the program manual, it was stated clearly to us, to the evaluators. Um, you have to have tested your prototype uh, at, at the natural environment, so at full scale. Um, Many people uh, uh, underestimate the, uh, this need for technology level uh, six and they apply for something theoretically that is still at concept level or it is lab, laboratory tested only. Um, 
What they told us about the feasibility study to answer to our colleague here is that uh, this 50,000 gift, if they identify a very good proposal, they give you 50,000 that you can spend any way you wish. There's no commitment how you will spend uh, this 50,000. So uh, there, are, uh, there are many, many uh, reasons why uh, one who has developed a uh, good prototype at uh, full scale uh, to, to write a feasibility study. First of all, you have identified something for a certain application and you want to diversify. You open the scope a little bit. Then you have to address the risks to the market, the barriers. So you need a feasibility study. Or you do your feasibility study and get the 50,000, that's all. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Treat Thank it you. as a gift. <clears throat> I think that uh, probably takes us to the end, and we thank uh, Christian for answering the questions he was able to answer. <laughs> Perhaps he'll give us uh, some more information if he can find it from his colleagues. So thank Christian again. Thank you.